Today we're going to take a look at Counter Blast Adventure Battle Game by Bombshell Miniatures. So, I didn't see the Counter Blast um, uh, rule book uh, per se first. I actually saw the miniatures first for the game itself. Um, a faction called the Edo, um, and they, the, this here is the Galactic, De uh, Galactic Defense Force, or the GDF. And I saw the miniatures, and I was introduced by a friend of mine um, to the miniatures uh, to paint them for him. And uh, he sent the rule book. <laughs> so I could take a look at it. Um, and I was actually kind of interested. Uh, it was kind of interesting. It's very different, a uh, very different science fiction world, uh, kind of like a, not really a space opera, but maybe a space punk uh, kind of uh, rule book um, setting and stuff like that. And um, I started reading the rules and I couldn't stop. Uh, it was just so different and interesting at the same time. Uh, I just had to share it with everybody else. So this is Counter Blast, um, the rule book. It's a hardback rule book. Uh, I believe they only have one left of these in stock, um, but they do have a PDF uh, that's very reasonable um, if you're interested in the rules. Uh, but it's a Counter Blast is a skirmish level miniatures battle game in the atomic ray punk setting. So players control the groups of pulp sci-fi heroes uh, applying the spaceways in search for uncharted worlds, alien artifacts and new territory, and colonization and essential deposits of Ultonium. Uh, so basically that's kind of like a one sentence <laughs> uh, explanation of what exactly Counterblast is. Um, so, you know, that, that sounded interesting. And, you know, I'll look at the miniatures here um, uh, on the uh, with the rule book and everything like that. Uh, just looking on here, wow, that looks neat. You know, I can see how I can use these miniatures in pretty much any setting. And they got clear helmets, clear plastic helmets you can put on them after you finish painting them. So that's, I thought that was kind of interesting. So uh, immediately the artwork looks very old school. Uh, I really like it. Looks RPG, um, which is really neat. And uh, you uh, open the book, and uh, of course you got the table of contents, uh, very well laid out. And it talks about all the factions right away. You can see you can have robots, Galactic Defense Force, the uh, Edo Fellini, Fili Fili the Lancers, the Mechas. Mechas is kind of like machines. It's just you know, laid out very well. And uh, it gives you an explanation of what exactly Counter Blast is, um, kind of like a uh, synopsis of the storyline um, of where the Edo come from, the Mechas come from, uh, and why there is a Galactic Council of Worlds, uh, the GCW, which has the, the uh, Galactic Defense Force, and the reasoning for reasoning for them coming together. Uh, the story is explained in the 1950s, uh, 1941, when Japan attacked um, are when we attack Japan, the nuclear blast uh, interests uh, some aliens and beings from another planet, and they attracted the power to unleash during, you know, uh, uh, the the power during the Trin Trinity atomic test. So, then they decided to investigate the world of the humans, basically, uh, these alien races, and there was two main ones from the Galactic uh, Council wor of worlds of, of factions or races uh, called the Anavar and the Galenians. And the Galenians, which is interesting, <laughs> their planet was, uh, they started making these machines uh, to fight their wars, and these machines became uh, uh, self-aware, and that uh, in turn made the Mechas, and they destroyed Galenian Prime, but they still had this council, and they went from galaxies to galaxies trying to um, uh, uh, get other people interested in trade, and it worked out, uh, and uh, there became this Galactic Council of Worlds. Uh, the Nerean Empire, these, uh, <laughs> these fellows, they're uh, all about galactic domination, or galaxy domination. Um, of course, they're like the evils, I guess you can say. Uh, they have a royal house, of course. Um, it's a kind of a uh, kingdom, more than anything. And it is highly ritualized. So, and at times it can be quite brutal. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it's an ancient civilization 
prior to the first galactic war that they had, then they're, they're now encompass much of the known galaxy and the threat of their expansion into the remaining uh, free territories, uh, contested regions is ever present. Um, their culture is really driven by conflict and conquest. So we kind of already know, you know, kind of, you know, the type uh, and play style that they would have. Uh, the Edo are an ancient civilization of <laughs> these lo octopus, octopus looking characters uh, with uh, and crab like characters. And uh, they recently arrived in the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, for all the inhabitants, this is part of space, you know, so they, they, they do not yet exist here in great numbers. Uh, but the few ships of their bizarre fleet, they, they, uh, they look like gigantic floating colonies of coral, which is pretty cool. And they're known commonly as the Edo. And uh, they strip star systems and, uh, of their resources is what they do. And they enslave and, and consume all inhabitants they come across. And they're, 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 they're cephalopods. That's what I was looking for, cephalopods. And they have these brain-shaped heads you know, that look like, and they look like octopuses with all their tentacles and things like that. And they have psychic abilities or psi abilities, you know, typical alien race. Um, so you have the Galactic Alliance, you have the machines, you have the Edo who just basically consume everything. Uh, the uh, the Nairin, Nairin, hopefully I'm not butchering that. Um, they're more on conquest and conflict. That's what they're all about. So those are the main-ish factions. You also have the Lancers. The Lancers are a combination of like pirates and mercenaries and things like that. So it's just kind of an overview. And uh, then you get into the game and how the game plays. So your normal playing surface is a three by a three foot by four foot area, and it's a T D10 dice system and use inches. And the models themselves are either small, medium, or large, meaning that 25 millimeter base is a small, uh, 40, uh, medium is 40 millimeter, a large is 50 millimeter plus. Um, and, you know, <laughs> um, that's how they distinguish what type or what size models they are on the table itself. And then you need some detents and some counters to keep track of not only what they call dread, which is, you know, Dread's kind of like their morale system and their panic and panic system uh, that, that is in, in the game itself. And also something to keep track of what they call moxie, which is, you know, your activation tokens, per, if, you, if you will. Um, so it's D10s and, and, and it goes by inches. Um, and then there's, you know, unit types. There's heroes, lackeys, and vehicles. Um, and they have a lot in here. So uh, your heroes is your main leader. Uh, he can be activated with a couple of your, your lackeys in, uh, during a turn. Um, uh, you, you just you have one main leader, just like most games, and then you have all your rest of your la lackeys and fighters, and then you, you, they add into vehicles. And they all have a stat line. And basically, they have a size, what size they are, small, medium, large, a move stat, a metal, uh, they call it a metal, a metal stat. It's the amount of damage that the model can take before it's become downed or removed as a casualty. That's your life, basically, metal. Uh, then they have zap. Zap is how many dice you roll for a shooting test. Grit is for melee combat. Uh, knack is kind of like smarts for panic and, and, and some sort of type of other uh, checks. Defense is how many dice you roll uh, against shooting attacks, and uh, your defense uh, subtracts from the uh, the combat result of how much damage they take. So, and it's a ability check and a dice system where if you have to check, say, your zap, well, your zap, the difficulty is a seven because they're within a certain range. Uh, so you, on here, it says zap is 2D. So you take 2D10, and uh, they say take a zap, uh, zap seven test. Well, a seven plus is a success. So let's say you roll two dice and you roll two sevens. That's two successes. If you only rolled one seven and the other one was a six, well, there's only one success. If you roll a 10, a natural 10, that earns you another die, which means you'll be rolling three instead total. If that's a 10, you'll keep going. It's an exploding 10 system. So anytime you have to make any kind of check or dice check or a shooting attack or a melee attack, 
you're going to be ro rolling against a difficulty number of seven uh, or an eight or, or better or worse based on their equipment and their special abilities. Um, you can, players may measure any distance at any time. So you can measure any time. Line of sight. Um, you, you have complete line of sight as long as it's not obscured by anything. You draw a line between it and the other thing. As long as it's not obscured, you have complete and unobscured line of sight. Um, I, I can't remember. I think it's one third of the model has to be, they get cover benefits, but, uh, um, I'm not 100% on that, but there are benefits of cover, but you have to have complete line of sight of being unobscured in order for them not to get any kind of cover bonus. Pretty standard, most games. So um, there's certain conditions that models have that affect line of sight or other things like stunned or down or uh, um, spent or you know, uh, so on and so forth. And then we get into playing the game, the actual playing the game, the phases of the game. So. The f they they go through uh, and explain. You assemble your crew, uh, you assemble your terrain, you set up the table, you go through the missions, and um, then you start going through the phases. Um, there's missions in this game. So between two or more crews are referred to as battles. So players decide up front whether they are playing a single, ba a single battle or a campaign battle. And single battles are just that, one-off matches, Campaign battles can be played as part of a larger story. And in this book itself, it tells you how to upgrade your crews and uh, what happens to them after each battle. So each crew selects its one mission before the battle. So you have a list of missions in the game and you each choose one of the missions that, you would, that you're going to perform, either randomly or you, you just choose it outright. And they specify what objectives and the victory point conditions and other relevant information needed for gameplay. And they, the mission types vary quite a bit and are usually open to any crew at any time. So it's not like one crew is better at it than others. They could be. It depends on how you kit out. And this is a point-based system. So uh, 500 points worth of miniatures are models with all their equipment, which there's tons and tons of options, which I'll show you later, uh, uh, on how to build your crew and kit it out based on what mission you, you, you want to play. So a normal game is about 500 points. Um, but uh, then it starts start talking about the turn. So the first phase is the moxie phase. And the way this works is you count all the miniatures on the table and you, uh, you have say six miniatures. Uh, that, is, <laughs> that is your moxie pool is what they call it. And each crew counts uh, uh, all the models and on the table and adds the bonus moxie. If you have any kind of bonus moxie or anything like that, uh, and you know, whoever has the highest amount of successes on a D10 roll, they will activate first. Uh, let me rephrase. So <clears throat> with this moxie that you're, you're getting a pool together, you use this moxie to, uh, you spend it to activate your models single or in groups. Uh, to use it to trigger reactions. You can take additional actions. You can actually reduce your dread or your morale at the end of the turn. Uh, and basically the way, that's the way Moxie works. You basically, you're generating your Moxie pool. So if you only got six guys left, you get six Moxie to, uh, in, in your Moxie pool. So activation phase we take that moxie and it says during the activation phase, one crew will be active and the other crew will, crew will be the reactive player. So to decide which is which, both crews will roll a moxie check versus seven. The one that rolls the most successes is the active crew for the duration of the activation phase. So what that means is, is you have a moxie of six. You roll six dice because you have six models. All the seven pluses, that would be your number of successes against his number of successes. Let's say he only had five miniatures and he rolled four sevens and you rolled six sevens. You would be the active player during that turn. Uh, so it's based on how many miniatures you got left, how, uh, you know, what, what are your, your, your chances are of being able to go first. And that's not always a good thing to go first because, you know, you want to react to certain things. Um, so, <clears throat> After you've rolled your moxie, you choose a model to activate. You can either do a single, a group, you can pass your turn and use your moxie to pass the turn. And as you're doing these activations, you are spending your moxie for the turn. 
So you can spend all six Moxie on one guy, or you can spend three Moxie on three different guys. You can spend two Moxie to activate a, uh, a hero and two lackeys. You can spend, spend it to use to do actions and reactions. So when somebody activates a model, your opponent could spend a Moxie to make a reaction to what that model is doing. So it's an action reactive and it keeps both people in, in, engaged and both players engaged in, in the actual game itself. Um, so there's also the multitasking rule, which means that you, are, you can do as any series of actions during your turn, uh, but you can't do the same action twice. So, so let's, you can run, or I'm sorry, you can rush, is what they call it, rush. It's kind of like a run. It's a random roll. You can move up to 10 inches or you can move just one. Uh, or you can move, just move, move your move stat on there. So it's up to you, but you cannot do multiple of the same action during a single activation. So it may not use the same action twice. That's, that's exactly how it's worded. So if you're trying to make a reaction, the reaction is cost one moxie and the model that triggers reaction becomes stunned after it is solved, resolved. So if you are taking reaction, you're going to become getting the stun reaction at the end of that, uh, that reaction. So moving on from there, then there's the attack sequence. Uh, the, uh, during the action phase, that's pretty much where all the meat and potatoes happen. Uh, and part of that is the attack sequence. So you can either do any of these actions on the list. There's a groups of maneuver actions, combat actions, recovery actions, skill actions, team actions, react and, and, and reactions that you can do. So that's a list of things that you can do with your character when you activate them. Uh, one of the neat things is your skill actions. Uh, there's a, you, you can be an engineer and, and uh, or, or you can treat somebody or you can engineer and, and treat a machine to uh, help them remove health or to fix them from being spent or, or stunned, things like that. Uh, you can uh, heal somebody to take away wounds. Um, you can do team actions like boost, you can aim assist, you can dogpile. And you know those are very specific things that you can actually do during your turn. You can aim, you can shoot, you can strike, you can throw. You, you know, and, and based on what you do, there's an asterisk here. It says this action does not cause the model to be spent. Once you're spent, you're done. So a move action would it has an asterisk and it does not cause the model to be spent. But if you try to rush, he's spent, you can't react with him. So it's pretty simple. Uh, the attack sequence is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You can split your attacks up between multiple models. Uh, you just choose a weapon, you choose a target, you roll the ability check for that, which is a, a zap test, uh, which is your zap ability. Uh, if you're in close range, it's always a seven plus. Anything above close range uh, will be an eight plus. It's pretty simple. Uh, based on your, if your zap is a 2D, that means it's you roll two dice, seven or better, close range, you know, that's how many, how many successes is how many hits. So you resolve your damage and any effects based on the weapon that you're using, because the weapons have specific, you know, uh, effects that they can uh, put on the person if they hit them. Uh, and then you resolve your damage. So resolving your damage, you, so whenever a model takes raw damage, which means that they're going to take the straight damage, uh, from whatever they got shot with, whatever successes, uh, it rolls a defense check against the difficulty of seven. So your defense is a 1D, 2D. So each success re reduces that damage by one. So let's say you did two hits, you get two defense dice, you roll two successes, seven are up. Well, that negates that damage and he missed. So it's pretty straightforward uh, when it comes to shooting and uh, and things like that. So... Um, it also depends on the weapon type, the range, the difficulty, the ability, and the effect that it has on uh, based on what weapon they're using and things like that. Uh, now, once a model is damaged tokens, it usually stuck with them until the end of the game, but not always. So while specific actions and gear require will vary, removing damage always follows the same rules uh, and uh, you can stabilizing models. So any model can attempt to stabilize another model regardless of their equipment or training by using the appropriate action. So an engineer is used to stabilize robots and treat uh, is used to stabilize living models and cyber forms. So if you become, become uh, stunned or, or unstable or for any reason, you can actually go up to that model and uh, if it's an engineer, if you have an engineer skill, you can stabilize a robot or you can treat to stabilize a living model. So uh, healing also works the same way. 
models that uh, have the right gear are able to remove damage uh, tokens entirely. But when a model attempts to heal another, it rolls a knack seven. So you have a knack score. Whatever your knack score is, the amount of dice that you get to roll, uh, every set, seven and up, that's a success. And um, you remove one damage token from the target for each success, down to the minimum of one. So you're all, if you, once you take a damage, you're always going to have a take a damage. Um, now, uh, there's med kits, tool kits, um, med gel, quick fix, fix in the gear that it will assist you to remove all the damage um, uh, altogether. So. All right, so upkeep phase. So the upkeep phase is all spent models must become unspent. So once you once you do an action that spends the models, meaning that they, they can't react, they're done for the turn, um, you unspent them. So you put a token saying they're spent. They can't react, they can't do anything else that turn. They are spent. Um, if there's models that are down, they are the, that are, are uh, that are not also stable, are removed as casualties. So if you're down and unstable, you're removed. Uh, all down models that are stable though, become unstable. So that's how you become unstable. So you can actually stabilize models and it all has to do with the damage and resolving damage and what happens and effects and conditions and stuff like that, whether they become stable or unstable. Um, and if the leader is on the table and not down, uh, if the leader is, is on the table and not down, it may spend moxie to immediately reduce its dread level by one moxie spent. One per moxie spent. So the dread level is something like I was talking to you guys about that is kind of like the morale system for, for the game. So no one goes in the outer reaches without being at least a little brave. But when the beams start flying and the, uh, and the friends start dying, even the boldest begin to question whether it would have been better to stay in bed. So this is a, something that really intrigued me and I really liked about this game is, is at the end of a round, based on what happens to you and what you do in that round, will actually be calculated for how your morale will um, be affected or the morale, pardon me, morale of the troops. So during the course of the turn, the models will take damage and eventually go down or be removed as casualties. And at the beginning of the panic phase, each crew adds an amount to its dread level as follows. So you'll have a dread level. You'll have to keep track of this. You can do that with tokens. It's fairly easy. Um, even when nothing particularly bad has happened, you add one to this, to the dread. So that's forcing people to spend moxie or save moxie at the end of the turn to get rid of the dread because if there is a combat that happens, even when nothing happens, you at least add one. And for each of the down models that you have, you add one. For each of the models that was removed as a casualty, you, that turn you remove one. And for each of those casualties that was a hero, you add one more. So if the crew's dread level is greater than the number of its models remaining on the table, each model in that crew must roll a knack seven. So you're rolling your knack score. Models that fail this check become panicked. So that's a whole different thing. They become panicked and they become harder to control on the table and things like that. Uh, most games will, add, uh, will end after six turns and until or until one whole crew is left and the other is not. Uh, then it gets into obscure, battle scoring, objective scoring, and de degree of type of victory. Most games have those type of things. That's it. Those are the rules. That's nitty gritty down. You know, that's how you play one turn. So you do that six times. And eventually, if you have enough down, down men or did enough fighting where you've taken casualties and stuff like that, your guys will start running away. So it's kind of uh, interesting. And I, I really like the, how, how they did this system. You're always going to be getting dread because, you know, war is scary. <laughs> and people start thinking, did I do the right thing? Uh, so uh, as we, uh, those are all the actions you can do. And it goes into further explanation of what exactly they do. If you move, you move your move stat. If you rush, it's a D10 roll and you move that amount of inches. You can jump if you're jumping over a gap and you don't roll far enough uh, for that jump or you don't you get, you can't get across, you fall. Uh, you, you, you can measure up things and climb up things. Uh, they also talk about your combat actions like close combat. They call it strike. Shooting tells you exactly how it works. And, and uh, if you can aim, but if you aim, 
you know, it has that ash aiming does not spend your model. So shooting and striking does, but the asterisk means aim. Nope. That doesn't spend your model, but if you're aiming and shooting, it's going to spend the model. So that's kind of how that works. Um, you have specific skill actions like engineer treat. You can hack things. You can do sidecraft. Uh, people who have ciphers, as they call them, are capable uh, of far more than just shooting. So uh, lightning from their hands and exploding things with their minds. Uh, they can also do useful things like make toast, uh, deep toast. Uh, 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 ciphers and use Psycraft to activate enigmas and create passive effects for aid to activate, uh, I'm sorry, to, to aid their allies. And it spends the model. The action spends the model because it doesn't have an asterisk. Uh, you can have team actions. Things if you're activating as a team, you can do uh, a team action uh, to boost your, mo your the models, uh, to aim assist, uh, to dogpile in on a close combat, things like that. Uh, you have also have your reactions that you can perform. You can counter strike, disperse, parry, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's the certain conditions that can happen based on weapons or what happens to you, whether you're down, uh, you could be burning, you can be blinded, um, whether you're engaged, you're half blind, uh, half blind, uh, you're marked, you're pinned, you're prone, you're spent. Uh, though it tells you what it means he spent. It says, even the greatest heroes can only do so much once. Models become spent by taking certain actions and become unspent during the upkeep phase. Spent models cannot be activated. So during the upkeep phase, they can, they can uh, become unspent. Uh, you can be stunned. Um, and then they go into talking about the model features. So um, these are certain features that your models have on them, like bonded, controlled, a uh, cruiser. These are kind of like traits, uh, deep thoughts. This model may select an additional enigma beyond uh, that allowed by a psychic feature. Um, so these are kind of like the model's traits that go along with them. Uh, and then it immediately goes into how to assemble your crew, your leader, your crew affiliation, your crew specialties. Uh, and it gives you a breakdown for each faction. Um, um, of what their specialties exactly are and to help help and assist you uh, in building your character. So then they call about the psionics and the deep, they call it. Um, these are psycraft, psy strikes, uh, psychic abilities or psy abilities that they can have enigmas um, and stuff like that. They go through that. And then they talk about your terrain and your environment. So they give you some terrain rules, which is great. Um, and uh, how they affect your, um, like ungrouped features. So burning, you can have burning or deep black, deep blackness. It could be slick. Uh, these are ungrouped features of the uh, terrain that you're using, ladders and stairs. There are rules for just about anything uh, you can use in the game. Um, they do have rules on how much terrain you're supposed to have. So uh, the terrain, the terrain could should be cover 25 to 50% of your table. Um, and that's a good amount of terrain. Uh, then they talk about vehicles, and vehicles are really neat in this game. Um, uh, of course, you have to have some sort of, you know, some vehicles in a science fiction game. Uh, and then they go into equipment. Uh, and your vehicle rules, by the way, are only a couple pages. Uh, there's not a lot, um, but they are interested, interesting. They talk about weapons, arcs, and things like that, and what you can carry. Then they talk about equipment, which is your weapons and other weapons features. I mean, they have so many awesome choices that you can choose from. Um, faction specific stuff and upgrades and devices and tools that you can choose from. And everything obviously has a point cost. Then they get into the talking about the missions. Um, so everyone goes, you know, uh, before each battle, each player chooses a mission. So alternatively, players may randomize this and determine their missions by rolling 1d10. So you would select one of these things individually that you would want to accomplish in this game. You select your own missions, which I've never, I don't think I've ever seen anything. I mean, I've seen where they say, okay, this is the, 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 the game and or this is the scenario and here are your objectives you must complete. This one here, you choose. Uh, and... Uh, they, they talk about how they're used, their tokens, and the points cost, and the development of e evac points, where it's evacuation points. And then they give you details about each objective and what you need to perform that objective on the table. Uh, there's abduct, construct, escort, evade, invade, recover, sabotage, scout, 
triage. So there's, uh, you know, I think that's eight total. Yes, eight different kinds of missions you can choose one when you fight. And then they talk about campaigns. There's an extensive campaign system in here that is faction specific or not and not non-faction specific. So the GDF and campaigns, here's are things that they can they can upgrade to and 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 uh, on their uh, their crew. And that's just amazing. So there's so much here to tell a story, and that is the type of game I like to play. And it's very interesting because there is a ton of, of just many different things like in foam pellets, med gel, and quick fix, okay? Armor, xeno, uh, xeno turf gear, delta shield, and there's just so much variety in here to tell a story. It's ridiculous. I, I, can, I, I was very impressed. Um, with the amount of, uh, of stuff that's in here. Now, there is an extensive background on the world and how it came to be and who's involved and what type of um, head leaders and stuff like that to make your story. I mean, there's like, I don't know, 10 pages maybe uh, talking about the galaxy and the story of the whole entire world and how it became to be. And then we go into the faction specific stuff. Uh, now, I know that this here is a free download from uh, Bombshell Miniatures, um, uh, the stats for each faction. It's called the appendix, uh, but it tells you a little bit more about the faction itself, uh, a, a much more in-depth background, and each one has it. And these, are, these are the army lists is what I should say. Um, you have your Edo Prime for the Edo and your stat lines, and you get to choose armor options, weapon options, gear options below each character, and they tell you what's available and a brief description of what they are. There is an Edo Guardling, which is level one, two, and three. So, you know, you can have them upgraded as far as you want or as little as you want. Um, and there's just a ton of options. Uh, on these pages for bioweapons, kits, bombs, devices, and they tell you exactly what they do on the table and their ranges and how much damage they do. So you have the Edo, the Galactic Defense Force, which is the basically combined uh, humans and uh, um, the, the, great, the good, uh, uh, the Galactic Defense Force defending the galaxy for, for everyone. Um, it's kind of like the police force of the galaxy. Um, and it also has tons of options. And we have the Lancers. So the Lancers are kind of like the mercenaries or the pirates. Or, um, they're loners. They operate independently. They're bounty hunters. They're bodyguards. They're prospectors and, and free agents. Uh, which is kind of neat because they're, they're, you know, there's a mercenary force and everybody loves mercenary forces and all the factions are involved with the Lancers or can be. Uh, even the, uh, the uh, 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 Nerian, Nerian um, kingdom type conquest and conflict faction is the same. So uh, then you have uh, the Mechas. And now the Mechas are really interesting. I really like the Mechas. The Mechas is what destroyed the Gilliam Prime planet, which is one of the uh, main factions that came up with the Galactic Defense Force or the Galactic Council. Um, and uh, because they created the Mechas machines and they became self-aware and they, they, they totally destroyed the, 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 the Galilean um, uh, faction or race and took over the planet. And now they're expanding to get more resources to build more uh, machines. So... You know, it is a faction of self-aware machines, which is really awesome. Um, and they have the main computer that's on the table that, you know, you have to have there, the central command unit, um, in order to uh, give out orders to the robots to do what they're supposed to be doing. And tons and tons of different options to go with those as well. Uh, there, here's the Nerian. Uh, which I was just talking about, the Nerian Empire. It has one leader and one leader only. Um, and she is a badass, if I might say. And um, they're all about ritual and conquest and conflict and just annihilating uh, other 
uh, factions and races. And they're very elite warriors, and um, they're just really awesome. So once we get through those, then you got the Renegades. Uh, <laughs> the Renegades, uh, they're, they're the shining image of the Galactic Defense Force that would, cause, that, that would cause most under its protection to be surprised to discover that there are those who leave its ranks without permission. So while deserters are uncommon due to the GDF's volunteer policy, those faced with the moral dilemma enlisted in the uh, planetary draft or shaken by difficult training or even harsher experience of actual combat, sometime decide to flee their military obligations to make their own way the best way they can. <laughs> so they're quite literally the renegade, renegades, the deserters, the hired guns, um, and they can be just about anything. And then of course you got the robots and you can have a complete robot force, which is really cool. And they have tons of options for them as well. So, and then you have individual characters, which are uh, named characters that you can use in your game, which is great. They give you some stats laid out there, which is pretty cool. And also they give you tons of resources um, and some neat artwork in there. And of course you have your, uh, your, crew, your crew roster for one uh, single games, and then you have your campaign rosters that you can print. Uh, permission to print is granted at the bottom. And then you have your gameplay summary. So that is Counter Blast. That is just a synopsis of how it works. Um, really interesting. It really intrigued me. I never in a million, I, I never thought that this something like this would come my way. It just happened upon me. And uh, it seems really fun to play. It seems very interesting. It's a little bit more involved than some of the games I, I play most of the time. Tons and tons of options, but I can see the story replayability out of this and getting that kind of cyberpunk, Ray Punk, like Flash Gordon, kind of Necromunda kind of feel out of this game, especially with that panic phase, uh, the dread and how the dread goes up and the game gets more intense as it goes on and the, the battle gets more intense. It kind of gives you that feel of the battle. Um, so it seems really interesting. I'm going to be checking this out and playing this game, actually putting it on the table here pretty soon. Uh, but overall, um, it is a good rule set. I actually was impressed and surprised by it. So um, we'll have to see how it plays on the table. I'm sure it'll play uh, it'll play great. It'll be a good fun because it's a miniatures game. And that's what we like here at Rocky's War Room, especially ones that you can tell a story with. And I th really think that this is going to do that. Uh, the miniatures are fantastic. He's uh, switching everything over to resin, which is great. I think you get more detail out of that. Uh, there's some metal models that you can get right now. Uh, the Edo faction is pretty awesome. I've already painted a few of them. And I definitely got the Edo. Uh, I had to have the octopus big brain looking guys for sure with the side craft that they can throw at people. So, And of course, the Galactic Defense Force. Uh, I have to get some of those because, hey, somebody's got to rule the galaxy, right? Uh, and I can just make them renegades one day or do something else with them. So, But, uh, you know, fun game. Good rule set, um, rather surprised and impressed with it. Um, and uh, when you come across a book that's, you know, this thick, a rule book like this, you, th this thick, you always get worried just a little bit. It's going to be too meaty and hard to understand. This is very straightforward, very easy to learn. I almost had all the rules locked in within one look through of the rule book. So uh, it's not complicated. You're looking at maybe 15 total pages of rules for this game. Everything else is just fluff and background. And as you saw, uh, just tons of different equipment and options and vehicles and weapons and just all kinds of different flavor in there. So uh, we'll be telling our stories with Counter Blast. So I appreciate you joining me. Please hit the like button so you, you like this video. Uh, hit that bell so you don't miss a thing. And last but not least, from me to you. Ta-ta, and we'll catch you in my next video.